Your Excellency, Joyce Saluch, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, I think your keynote address was in many ways inspiring, especially for the, for the youth, uh, to see you know, what potential is there with international law to promote human rights. We'd love to ask you a few questions to, to follow up on the speech. Yes. And let me, let me begin right away with the first. As you've been working as a judge, both the International Criminal Court of Justice, as well as the High Court in Kenya, what recommendations would you give for strengthening the capacity for international law to encourage the universal adoption of human rights? Apart from being in the High Court in Kenya, I also served in the Court of Appeal. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's when I was then elected to join the International Criminal Court. Cool. Cool. And um, what I see uh, where I am now at the International Criminal Court is how it is influencing domestic law in many, many countries. Okay. And that means that um, the younger people, the younger generation, the ones, the lawyers who are coming up, yeah. they will have better opportunities than we, some of us ever had because they are going, uh, national jurisdictions are adopting international statutes okay. and therefore they can practice law and learn about uh, human rights and international uh, law okay. at their very own in their own very own countries. Otherwise, um, human rights was kind of a removed area, and it was left more for the civil society. But I think more and more, and more in the court system in many countries, at least in my country, in Kenya, okay. now the courts are making bold decisions uh, using human rights as principles. Interesting. And, 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 and I think in that way, uh, human rights principles are expanding. Okay. Yeah. It's good to hear that. I was just having a conversation with the other judge from Botswana, and she was saying in Botswana it's actually a different issue. Uh, where there she said the youth, they don't care about human rights. And, uh, essentially this is sort of an, an older generation issue. And she's seeing in Botswana there's a need really for more interaction. That really the youth aren't so interested in this. It sounds like Kenya is, is a better situation there, where you're saying that the young generation is saying this is our responsibility, we do want to get engaged. Is that true or do you see some sort of a generational split in terms of interest or engagement? Not in issues of human rights. Okay. No, okay. I think the, 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 the lawyers, when I, I'm, uh, I'm in contact with lawyers okay. Okay. in the law society, for example, and the FIDA, which is the women lawyers, practicing women lawyers, yeah. I'm in the mailing list of both of them. Excellent. And I can see that the, the younger generation are very much more involved in issues of human rights than even six years ago when I left Kenya. That's great. So it sounds like really a success story where one has succeeded from the global level to get to the national and also the, the next generation. But I think um, one thing that has also helped the situation, one thing that has made them not help but made them much more aware is that uh, we had this, unfortunately we had this case at the International Criminal Court that almost uh, touched the country. Okay. These are our leaders, yeah. and it touched the country. So the younger generation, everybody, the younger generation, okay. had to read more and find out. And then um, we had, whenever there was a trial going on uh, of our leaders, it was televised live. Okay. So everybody got very interested <coughs> in, 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 in international law. Okay. And that has, I think that has helped to develop international law in Kenya Excellent. a lot. Okay. It was a very unfortunate situation that it was our own leaders, mm -hmm. but in the whole process, it has made uh, ma many people, all, especially the younger generation, got very interested in international law and okay. issues of, of issues of international law. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I'd like to ask you a question about cultural diplomacy. Now, very often there seems to be this collision between culture and human rights. Uh, where on the one hand there's this tendency, I respect your culture, you respect my culture, mm. that's it. Mm. Uh, but then what does one do with human rights? Uh, what if there's a problem you know, yeah. between one of those cultural traditions? Mm. And especially as one looks at different parts of the world, it gets very complex. Uh, so my question is, where do you think cultural diplomacy can help? Uh, and secondly, have you seen successes where there's this, there's been this collision between culture and human rights, and we've been able to transcend and still protect human rights, despite maybe some cultural norms? Um. Before I was elected to join the International Criminal Court, okay. I was chairing um, a very important task force. Okay. We had a new piece of legislation in Kenya, okay. the Sexual Offences Act. Mm -hmm. And the Attorney General then uh, formed a task force okay. to help in the implementation of this act because mm -hmm. of the sensitivity of it involved. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, in, Africa culture, uh, in African culture, issues of sexuality are very culture protected. Mm. So this was um, a piece of legislation that um, had been passed by parliament. It was a private member's uh, motion. It was uh, initiated by a woman, nominated member of parliament. She lobbied for it. It was passed in parliament. It became law. Now, operationalizing uh, was not easy, uh, so I was given that task. So I could see, uh, you, you could see areas where culture, uh, uh, you, you know, where culture and, and human rights were kind of conflicting. Yeah, because, uh, you know, like marriage of underage girls, things like that, issues of um, uh, uh, rape and issues of, uh, you know, so we, I, ha, I had a team and we had to trade very carefully to try and, 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 and give this information out that we now have a law. You cannot just uh, uh, take, a, take, take a girl for FGM like you did before, you know. And, and, and then it was, it's also being very highly publicized in my country so that um, girls know that there are places they can run to if they are threatened with it issues of, uh, that will violate their, you know, their, 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 their person, their sexuality, like is, issues of FGM and, and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we are moving forward in my country. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. It's, uh, it's an area which has got a lot of sensitivity. It's not easy. But there are structures being put in place, which is, I think is what is important. There are structures mm -hmm. to help in the preservation of, of, of to promote human rights. There are structures, much more than before. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear that in terms of a broader, uh, let's say, development in the field of human rights in Kenya and yes. beyond. Final question I wanted to ask you about, it has to do with women and actually women's rights. Yeah. Uh, we have an initiative at the Institute called Born Equal, uh, where we're trying to look primarily at this issue of access uh, between the genders around the world. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see one of the biggest problems uh, is actually access, whether it's access to human rights, access to civil rights, access to opportunities. Um, so my first question, do you see reason for us to be optimistic as one looks at the issue of women's rights as a whole. I mean, for example, cases like Rwanda, uh, you know, yeah. where very much you've seen a lot of progress, even South Africa to a certain degree mm -hmm. as well. Um, would you agree? Is there a reason that we should be optimistic? Do you see these things moving in the right direction? And then my second question, what can we do to accelerate the process? Uh, in the sense, can civil society help uh, to try to get better results faster uh, when it comes to more equality between the genders? Yes, yeah, civil, uh, civil society can help, obviously. And civil society can always help in explaining and educating why there should be equal opportunities for both genders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in my country, um, very interesting, the last elections I was not there because I was here. Okay. And um, I noticed something, so when I went home I was asking, there, there were me, women members of parliament were elected. Okay. For the first time, because we had a new constitution which created the two houses, upper and lower okay. house. There's the uh, members of parliament and the senate. Okay. And I was very interested in noticing that, that not even one woman was elected to the senate. Mm -hmm. There are women there, but they are all nominated. Okay. So this, I, I asked several people, I said, what happened? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the answers I was given is that the constituency for senate, senatorial position was too wide. And, and, and it was probably not possible for women to, 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 to be able to meet this large constituency, to be able to, to, be able to campaign, because it included at like how many uh, constituents, in, in, as a member of parliament, you have one constituency you concentrate on. Yeah. As a senator, I'm told that one senatorial position, section would cover like how many constituencies. Mm, okay. So I said, uh, I, I, I said, I see, but then what's the way forward? He said, we, you know, way forward is, is, is just for the women, um, because in my country, the, people, the, the constitution has, there were some seats reserved for women, okay. but it did not go down well. Okay. Yeah, people did not think that it is a good thing, and even some women themselves thought that we are capable, we can fight okay. for these positions. Okay. So the, the obvious, discrimination against women, I can, as far as my country is concerned, 
I cannot tell you that a woman cannot do that, a woman cannot be appointed to that. No, we don't have that. Okay. But there are some areas where it's just difficult for us as women to penetrate through. But, we, 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 but I think women will, especially for in the next elections, those women who have served as nominated senators, I would want to believe that they want to run this time they, because they think they can manage. Yeah, and of course we have women ministers. That's a long, that's, 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 we don't have one or two anymore. The current government we have, we call them cabinet secretaries, but there are many women, very capable women. Excellent. Very, very capable women serving as cabinet secretaries. Okay. Yeah. So it's good. So it sounds like you are optimistic, but I think there still are issues of access and yes, also empowerment. Yes, there are still issues of access. Yeah. And that might be where civil society could focus to try to see how can we empower women more uh, and how can we raise awareness. And then, you know, when it comes to women, there are also issues of resources. Of course. Especially women. And at every level, at every level there are always issues of uh, resource mobilization for women. Yeah. Be there a woman who is feeding her, uh, you know, her family, who is doing small scale farming. But I see that mostly in politics. Okay. Yeah, women need to to mobilize resources to be able to uh, to be able to to move forward. I think in the in in, in politics especially. Okay. Yeah. So we have our work cut out for us, and so that's it. But we have our work cut out for us. Yes. So. Uh, just how to help them be able to raise uh, uh, their capacity, to mm -hmm. be able to build their capacity, raise their capacity to be able to fight for certain positions. Mm -hmm. Because elective positions, politics is, mm -hmm. is, is, is a question of numbers. Yeah. So you've got to mobilize the numbers. Mm -hmm. So in, I think in most African countries, it's still for you to mobilize the numbers, you, 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 know, you need resources. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So mm -hmm. these are areas that are still um, uh, these are areas that still need uh, a lot of work. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But other areas, I think women are taking their rightful positions. Fighting for those positions, yeah. you know? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for having this other uh, opportunity to exchange. And I don't know whether it means anything, but that's. <laughs> no, we're, we're very grateful. We are yeah. having a conversation. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. We, need, thank we, you we will have to continue thank conversations. You very much. Thank you. Thank you.